everyone for joining. We'll just give a couple minutes. This is something we do every first Friday, first Friday of the month um, at 12 o'clock mountain time. Uh, it's been interesting because we've had different content. You know, we've had, you know, Super Bowl uh, winners. We've had, you know, leadership from Google, just Vice Gehema. We've had uh, uh, Tamua Tabana, who's the VP of Premium Experience in Utah Jazz, just talk about their experiences and different topics. And so we realized, you know, that we wanted to just pivot just a little bit. And I think this is something that is a really important topic that a lot of our Pacific Islanders don't talk much about. And uh, certainly a, a really exciting topic. I'm gonna pull up just, just a, a slide or two really quickly, uh, and then we'll go ahead and kick off uh, and all the, all the early folks are gonna benefit. So we only have Buddha for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna transition to Stanley. So if this is, if, if you're joining for the very first time, uh, first of all, welcome. And what I would ask you guys do is please just put your name, your location, and your, you know, if you're representing a company, a company in the chat, because it's just an opportunity for all of us to get to know each other. Um, do you guys see my slide deck on the screen? Yep. All right, awesome. So first of all, Kenny's not here, but, but for those that don't know, next month uh, is the Asian Pacific Career Conference. Uh, if you're interested in attending and representing your company, tons of talent, uh, across you know all of the Pacific Islanders uh, islands as well as uh, the the Pacific and Asian Rim, so we would highly recommend that you guys you know attend if you're available. But really, the topic that we're going to cover today is something again, as I had mentioned, that we don't talk about enough. Um, so both of these guys happen to be my brothers, one by blood and one just purely by relationship for the last 15 years, and it's just interesting that they both had some unique experience with regards to mental health that I think everyone can learn from, right? And these guys have been in the limelight, um, both of which, which is, is something that I think it's important for them to talk about because it allows them to heal and grow, but both of which, um, luckily for us, uh, had failed suicide attempts um, due to depression, anxiety, in Stanley's case, addiction. And so the reason why I thought about this, and I asked, I asked Leroy or Buddha if he'd be willing to speak to the group uh, we will probably have a follow-up in person for our next in-person event with him. But as I was preparing, I was speaking at an assembly at Morgan High School, and I don't speak in front of big groups. And so this was going to be the biggest group that I was going to speak in front of. And it was about a thousand people. And so I just started, I called Buddha up and asked him if he could give me some advice. And then we just started talking about opening up and talking about mental health. And he said, that's just part of his healing process. And so Buddha asked if he could join me at the assembly, and it was amazing. And so uh, I'm super excited to, to have him. And then following him, I'll talk about Stanley. We'll transition to him. You know, but we're really, really excited to have one of the top media personalities here locally. Um, I, unfortunately, he's, he's like third tier. I tried to get Alema uh, Harrington. He wasn't available. Then I went to go get uh, Tamra Vaifanua. So now we have to settle with Big Buddha, but um, I'm just kidding. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn the time over for Leroy, or excuse me, Buddha, to tell his story um, and, and kind of his struggles and then just coming back to work this past Tuesday. Thank you, Shona. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, Shona is the first and only um, Tongan Olympic uh, skydiver. So you might want to ask him about that. He's Yes, he's the only Tongan skydiver because he wears uh, skydiving goggles everywhere he goes. Anyway, uh, thank you for that introduction. He and I would just have hold a on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. The only regret that I had of taking Buddha with me to that assembly is, is that everybody came up and wanted to take pictures with him. Not because he was Big Buddha, they actually thought he was Al Roker. Okay, actually <laughs> <wrong. laughs> oh, uh, Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, just, just the only thing that that separates Stanley and I is that um, I'm very new to this space. Uh, this is only my uh, this is only my fourth day back at work. I I am still in. It. I can feel it. Uh, I want to go back to when I was a boy. Many Polynesian males, uh, even females, our brothers and sisters, uh, we have suffered at the hand of our parents, loved ones, uncles and aunties. Um, this scar that you see on my head, 
It's from my dad, the dad that I love. And I know there are many, many of you like that, like me, have similar experiences. So, so some of you might say that's okay. So it's nothing new. We all we all got beat up by a two by four, a hose, or this and that. Here, here's where it started to affect me. Right, is I started going to school, and I started picking fights with kids who were bigger than me because I wanted somebody just to knock me out. I wanted, I wanted to die, but I did, but I didn't have the guts to do it. <laughs> I, I did. I mean, I would sit there and I would think like, well, if I, if I, if I did it with a knife, I would bleed all over the place. And my, 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 my family would find me. These things were in my head because like many of you, if your dad was heavy handed, my, my dad beat me up every day. And I had to hide it because my dad was the bishop. My dad, what, he was a spiritual leader. He was the principal for the church college, whatever the case was. I, I had to hide and I couldn't tell. And, and the thing that really messed me up was that being a spiritual leader, at least once a month or once a year, he had a checkup. He had an out. He had a way to tell people that he was doing this to me, doing this to my siblings. It, it sounds, this story sounds like I'm making it up. I, I remember it vividly. It is about, it's a year before we're going to Samoa. We're living in Compton. I, I grew up in Compton. Um, a year before we go to Samoa, my dad accepted a position to teach, uh, to be the principal for the Church College of uh, Viola in Savai. So we're at my grandmother's house and my dad plays this game. And I don't know if Polynesian men do this, but my dad did this, my uncles did this. Uh, he would put a lifesaver in his hand and he would hold it tight. And all of my cousins, girls and boys would come by and they would open my dad's hand. My dad would pretend to struggle and then eventually open it you know, ah, overcome adversity, right? I was the last one. This guy never opened his hand. He held it as tight as he could. So I got mad. I only, I said the bad words that I only said. I said two someone bad words. I was swearing. I didn't know what they were. I just said it because I heard, I knew there were swear words. My dad grabs me by my throat and slams me up against the wall, choke slams me. I'm being choked. I can't breathe. I'm crying. My grandmother comes from around the corner and hits my dad with the broom. Give a leer. Huh? Are you dumb? What are you doing? So my dad drops me, bends over, whispers in my ear, you're going to get it when we go home. The whole ride home, I could, I just, I was like, am I, I going to jump out? What am I going to do? Who can I tell? You know, you know those jokes that convenience talk about? Go ahead and call the police. It takes about 15 minutes for them to get here. That's a, that was my dad. My dad would say stuff like that to me all the time. I would come home, dad, my palangi friend Kenny said that you're not allowed to, to spank me, that I can tell the police and you'll go to jail. Yeah, go ahead. Call him, see what happened. <laughs> I know many of you know what I'm talking about. My dad, when we got home, he hogtied me. He made me take off all my clothes because those were the clothes he paid for. He bought those clothes. I bought those. After that, I thought I was done. No, this fool grabs me, slams me on the table. I'm on my stomach and he hogties me. My hands and my feet are bound. Behind where we live, the dumpster's right there. This fool opens the door and tosses me out like a trash. I'm in the dumpster, face down. I can barely breathe. And I'm wondering, am I going to die? That's not the worst of it. This, this doesn't happen until we get to Samoa. So I realize one thing. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me, let me, I got to get this out before, before I, I miss saying it. The, if I can call it a silver lining, and I know you men and women who have been abused, you know what I'm talking about when I say this. I, I guess you could call it a silver lining is that, that, that 
that fearlessness that we have here, the thing that makes us Pacific Islanders. You know, you know, the Palangis always talk about it. They always say, uh, Polynesians are the most friendliest person until you piss them off, right? Um, it, it, it's be, <laughs> we're not naturally like that, guys. We were made that way because our parents or, or our, our authority figures abused us. Whether, whether they thought they were doing a favor for us because that was the only playbook they had, it's still, it's still abuse. So in my journey, I, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm not giving my dad a pass. I'm not giving that guy a pass. I understand he had a limited playbook. He didn't have resources. I understand that. I don't hate the man. I hate the act. So what, how, how, how am I dealing with it? Um, 15 years in my marriage, I was a monster. I beat the crap out of my two oldest kids, just like my dad. Um, whatever my dad did to me, I was doing it to my two older kids. Um, my wife threatened me with divorce and we went and got couple counseling. So our couple and our relationship was saved. We're still doing counseling. Those of you who do counseling, you know that never goes away, but that stopped my abuse. I got counseling, anger management, all of that. I'm still doing all of that. So here, here, here's the thing that I've noticed now is that I have two sets of kids. My first two kids, man, they are not scared of anything. Now they're both Afakasis. Both of my kids are half, half Palangi, half Samoan, part Tongan. But my first two older kids, the ones that I was really bad to, I beat them up, I, I did horrible things. These two, They've already graduated with their college degree. My son's going on to his master's. They're only, they're 25, 26 years old. They have, they have a go get them attitude. I feel like it's the same attitude that I have. The three kids, the three bottom kids that I have never touched. I barely even yell. They, they're soft. I, I hate to say it that way, but there's a difference. There is a difference. It's like going through the 300 training, uh, that movie Spartans. Um, uh, uh, there, there was a video that went viral about two mis LDS missionaries, a uh, Samoan elder and a Palangi elder from American Fork. Two bandits roll up on a bicycle, a motorcycle. One of them bump, jumps off, puts a gun to the head of the Samoan elder. He grabs the gun, throws it down, starts beating this guys up, picks up the gun, throws it under, over the fence. The other guy on the motorcycle circles back. He turns around, boom, 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 takes care of business. The American Fork elder Ah, how, what am I doing? What am I going to, ah, woo, ah, right? Those are my two kids. Those are the two separate kids that I have now. I have the Samoan elder who will jump at anything because they're not afraid. Those are my two older kids. Uh, they could be Tongan too, uh, I'm not biased. Uh, but the bottom three kids are the American Fork elder who have frozen, who have not had what I like to call the 300 training. Uh, as, as messed up, and as jacked up as what my dad did to me in the manner that he did it, it gave me that fiercelessness that I could conquer anything. I think that really helped propel me into uh, this career with media. Uh, you know, in Samoa, we have this thing, uh, can you do it? You know, and people ask, you know, sometimes old men will ask me, why did you go on TV? And the smart, the smart Alec answer in me is, no, give me for you. Uh, I, I say stuff like that, but I believe, I believe anybody can do it. But for me, my, my story, my carrot was that my dad just beat the fierce, fearlessness in me. So I'm getting counseling. Uh, the depression is real. I, I can't, man, you, you want to talk about sad case. You want to sit in the airport, uh, 240 pound man, just crying. And everybody's walking around. I mean, for no reason. It, it feels like a, as Dexter describes it, a dark passenger. Um, I, I've had some relief as of late going to therapy. I used to have this, um, this knot that would reside right in here. And uh, uh, I would use it. I would, and this knot was my dad and, my, and the abuse. Um, so when I first started my career, I was always hit with, you can't be a feature report. You can't, you can't do that because you're not blonde. 
You're not blue eyes. You don't have blue eyes. You're, you're not blonde and, and, and a voluptuous woman. You can't do that. That position is mostly for, for women. You, you can't do that. Uh, I get into the radio business. Same thing. Pushback. So you're too big. You're, you can't use the name Big Buddha. It's, it's not, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of Samoans on the radio. You shouldn't do that. Um, I, I had a really good career, but, but everywhere I went, it was that way. Even when I got into TV, it was the same thing. Uh, you're going to have to you look a certain way, dress a certain part. And, and, and I, just, I just refused. I just refused to give in to whatever the standard it's called. And I, I wanted to be me. I wanted to just tell my own story in my own way. And so part of my healing, um, before I left Samoa to come back to America to go to school, my dad forced me, <laughs> he kind of bamboozled me to get the Samoan tatau. Uh, on my way from home down to the wharf, this dude is taking me to go to, uh, to come to Hawaii, to go to BYU Hawaii. On the way down to, it's about a five mile ride. He's, this guy's punking me the whole time. You're going to America. You said you can't do it. You can't do it. I'm getting mad, right? And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to say whatever I can because I'm about to jump on this boat. <laughs> I'm about to jump on this boat. This dude ain't going to catch me. It's good. Man, we get down to the, the three corners and I say to my dad, I say the English because I want him to understand me clearly. I say, bro, dad, that ain't nothing. I'll come back. I'll do it in three days. But too bad I'm going to Hawaii. This dude hits the signal. Turns into my auntie's house at Fusi. The tattoo artist is sitting there with all of my family's matais waiting for me. My mom was the only one that my dad didn't tell. So I'm angry. I'm mad. I get through the thing in four days. So long story short, I'm, I'm applying to go get it done again. W why is that? It's important to me. This is, this is my spiritual journey. I got to prove it to myself. Did I do it for me or did the old man really push him? So having conversations with my family, I, I got the best advice. My brother said to me in Samoan, he said, that tattoo is your dad's. That's our dad's tattoo. Let him have it. Now go get yours and complete your journey. That's, that's where I'm at. And I've come to a realization that this is not a job. This is not a career. This is a mantle. Um, this is a responsibility that I um, have uh, reset my values and my beliefs. And I am going to do everything I can, use my resources, I'm, I'm calling up movie stars that I've been friends with. They, they're like, oh, shoot, well, I haven't heard from this dude forever. <laughs> Dudes that told me, call me anytime. I'm like, yeah, okay, be careful what you wish for. And I'm pulling out every stop I can. I want to go to Samoa. I want to go to Tonga. I want to go to New Zealand. I want to go help as many of our Pacific Islanders figure this part out. What I want to do now is I want to put that fierce fearlessness into our younger Polynesians, but without the abuse. I don't know how to do that. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, but I hope that my story uh, and my experiences will help anybody out there uh, that they can benefit from. Um, if, if, if it hasn't come across, I am, I am so against uh, child abuse or any form of punishment, timeouts or any of that. Um, I know too many families who have not laid a hand on any of their kids who are just as successful just as strong and just as good uh, as people who got their butts kicked by their dads. So uh, any questions or I, I apologize. I, it's, this is all new to me. Like I said, it's, it's my fourth day back at work and, and, and I've kind of become like a sounding board. People are, are coming. I, I've, I didn't know if I was going to tell this story about um, having these demons, um, um, it, I don't have a lot of time, but I would love to share. I, I was sexually abused. Um, I figure if we gonna come clean, we might as well come clean all the way. Uh, when I attended the Boy Scouts, uh, I was a uh, I was uh, abused by a. I was abused by a scout leader. 
And that went on for several years until we went to Samoa. So um, I, I have not worked through that trauma, but at all, you know, the pandemic, if I could say this, this short term, this three month break that I took probably saved my life. It, it really helped me bring back to focus what was important for me. I was so caught up in trying to be the best feature reporter, trying to stack my chips because I wanted to go to LA. Uh, I was trying to put auditions in for Saturday. I was doing all these things that I thought I could get there, have a better platform for my people. I, you call it God, whatever you want. I just had this voice tell me, Sole, all the things you want, all the things you're trying to do, you already have it. You already have it there. Stop looking. You're there now. Do your work. Do your job. Pick yourself up now and go do some good. So that, that's where I'm at. I'm, I want to make myself available to whomever uh, I can help, you know, um, uh, mo most, mostly around these parts I'm known as the uh, class clown and practical joker. I, I still continue to do that, but I, I got to use this platform for good, man. I, I, and I'm hoping that I can get some help from my brothers and sisters. And thanks, Buddha. I know you got to go at 1230 um, and, and certainly appreciate your vulnerability and willing to to share your story. Are there any questions? We have Buddha for the next 10 minutes and then we're gonna to transition to Stanley. You know, but you guys see the happy face on TV every morning, every day, but you know, deep down inside, you know, my man was fighting demons and, and uh, I think it's just awesome that you're willing to open up and share that with us today. You know, it's funny is that when you're not going through anything and you wanna try drugs out, no drug dealers are available. It's the craziest thing. But when you're going through it, man, they answer your phone like nothing, man. It is the craziest thing. I'm like, really? You answer your phone right now? <laughs> All right, sorry. So I topped it for another time. Sorry. Any questions? We got we got eight minutes with this guy before he's got to go back on air. Any hey, questions got a, from anybody? Got a question. Um, Buddha, uh, first, thank you so much, uh, bro, for um just wanted to ask you is does the sharing this um story like does it help you with your healing you know i initially great question initially as i'm talking to the, the professionals you know they say that they said you know you don't have to but as we talk to people they tell us as they share their story one it kind of really lifts that 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 dark cloud, it's, if you've never been there, it's really hard to explain. Um, it's like, a, it's like a heavy, heavy cloud, heavy shadow, and it just weighs on you. I mean, it's like, if you've ever wrestled, and you've ever wrestled out of your class weight, and you had a big, big dude on you, oh yeah, that's how it feels, and you can't breathe, there are hands over your mouth, it, and it just, and it feels like the only thing you can do is to give into it. I mean, I've had my share of uh, uh, Jack Daniels, you know, Maker's Mark, uh, because those are the easiest things that can cut off those feelings. I mean, I totally understand why people do drugs and people uh, go to alcohol, because when you, when you have those voices in your head, you, you feel like you're drowning. And I wish, I, I, just, I just can't say it any, any further than that. And the only way that I could really shut it off was alcohol it was free it, not free it was it was it was cheap it was it was illegal and you could knock out and wake up and, and hope that everything was okay but but to answer your question yes this this I, I didn't think it was going to be healing for me um this is only my second public appearance sharing my story and, and it does it does empower me because after I share it I always have brothers and sisters that come in and share their story and say hey because you're sharing I think I need to go share too. And, and that's all I want. I, I don't want even, I don't even want people to come up and say that they're going through it. If it inspires them to look and seek out help, that's, that's what I hope happens. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Um, we have a question from Fui on the Zoom. He just said, hey, so you talked about the way you raised your older two versus your younger three. What was that process transitioning from being heavy handed to you know, just, just being different with them. And what do you recommend do differently based on what you know now? Man. I can't hear it. You know, 
that was such a hard transition because it was everything I knew. You know, dad, dad corrected me with his hand for everything. You know, uh, spilled milk, uh, bad tone, uh, the way you walk, the way you talk. I mean, everything, man. This, I mean, I got scars in my mouth from this dude. This dude be backhanding me all the time. And, and I thought that's what I needed to do. Man, I, my two older kids, oh, God bless them. They, they forget, oh, they say they forgive me. Uh, but I, when I talk to them and I try to come, you know, and I come correct and I tell them what I'm feeling and what I did to them, I think that was the first part of my healing because <laughs> my dad never took accountability. When, even when this dude was on his deathbed, I mean, I would jokingly ask, Dad, remember that time you hit me with the cricket bat? <laughs> no, that couldn't be me, right? I would be, and, and so in my mind, I'm like, is he joking? Or I never had this time to have a conversation with my father. So I, I so part of that is me doing what I think my dad would have should have done with me and my sister. I'm trying to do those things, you know. For example, man, if dad only would have talked to us, okay, write that down. I got to talk to my kids. Uh, I have been open to a point to a default where like my siblings are like, uh, they will overshare for you. <laughs> I think that's an overshare, brother. Don't, I, 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 I'm telling my kids everything. I want, I want them to be, I want them to be prepared. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming across stories of, um, <laughs> sexual abuse uh, in the family. You know, I, I'm hearing stories from cousins and from sisters. It, it's like it's commonplace in Samoa and Tonga. It, it's, like, it's like we sweep it under the rug, just, just like the, the, the abuse. It's like, let's just tuck it up to, because that's how Polynesians are, huh? No, abuse is abuse. And I think we need to take, take a stand. We need to keep them accountable. I'm not saying hate them. We need to make sure we just keep them accountable. So I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be accountable. Awesome. Thanks, Buddha. We're going to go to Losa. So Losa Patterson and then Lupe Havili, and then we'll let Buddha go. He's got to go on air. Um, but Losa, you want to go ahead and ask your question? I can do Thank about you. 10 Hello. more minutes, Jay. I can do about 10 Hello. more minutes. Hello, Public Buddha. Hi, Losa. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Sydney. First of all, I just want to thank you for being, you know, having the strength to tell your story because in telling your story, you, um, you're going to save many lives and especially be able to help them um, have the strength and be vulnerable like yourself. Um, uh, the question I have is, would you do a presentation for us here in the Pacific? Yes. We need you. Um, suicide is one of the biggest, you know, well, it is the biggest, most preventable disease in the world. And we, we have so many young people. Can, can I say this real quick, Losa? I this this thing about suicide, I was I was oblivious to the fact that, you know, I wanted I was I was part of the old school uh thought mentality where I, I hated the person that committed suicide, right? I was mad at them and 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 somewhere along the line in my journey, I realized, oh my gosh what have they been going through all this time? I'm thinking selfish, those guys are selfish, whatever. When, when I should have been thinking, why wasn't I there? Why didn't I reach out? Could, hey, they, you know what I mean? I, so so just, just the way that I think about suicide, even that ha has changed and, and I have more compassion. I have more empathy. I, I, I wish I would have had that sooner, but, but here we are. And I just, you know, I just want to do the best I can. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, Lassa. Would... Go ahead, Lassa. Did you have one more comment? No, okay. I just would love, I would love for him to do a presentation to the Pacific. I, I'm going to go Google you now because I don't know, I didn't know who you are. I'm sorry. Yeah, no just worries. Google Al Roker. Okay. Um, <laughs> just kidding, Buddha. So well, we'll go to in the summer. Bit. Only in the summer. It's winter, so there's not a lot of sun. We'll go to Lupe. And then after that, Buddha, if it's okay, because we're going to have you on an in-person event. Um, so we'll save anything else and then we'll transition sure. to Stanley. Lupe, yeah. one more question and then we'll transition to Stanley, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, Buddha, I really appreciate your vulnerability um, and just being here. 
Um, my question is, how has, you know, your journey with mental wellness impacted, you know, your environment and the people around you? And um, like, for example, in my situation or just in my experience with mental health, I've noticed, you know, like family don't really feel comfortable touching on it or even like recognizing it in the first place. And um, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Oh, great question and observation as well. Um, you know, I, I try to talk to my mom. My mom's old school, man. She like 75 years old. She old school. Uh, she's not going to change. Uh, my mom would rather me tell her that I'm possessed by a oh. demon instead of telling her that I have mental health issues. Yeah. Why got that? Why got mental Hey, I don't fight go read your scriptures. You know, if that's, you know, she's old school like that. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't really had any difficulty in my in my immediate family um i, I guess because they have been going through mental health issues as well so mm -hmm. it, it's become it's almost like when i bring it up it's become like oh shoot now i have a now i have somebody who can understand me who can relate yeah. it, it's really opened up my relationship with my uh, my children all my children are adults except for the baby he's a senior in high school and they're all married so it it has really changed the dynamic in, in the relationship. However, I do notice that there's still a bit of ridicule and I usually get it from my, my cousins and, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the typical thing. I, I, I knew it was going to come. I post yeah. one thing about mental health. The first thing from my cousin is da, 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 see, okay, you're not sick. I'm like, what the, what? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm going through something, man. Come on. You know, and then like, another cousin and then another. I mean, it's just like it was like they didn't want to hear it and yeah. they, they didn't want to believe. Uh, well, most of the time is what I heard I hear from my family. Like, but Sully, you're smiling, you're laughing. You have a great job. You're doing this. It's, it's you know, the, the real the real issue for me and, and, and everybody's going to have their issue was here I am. I'm a huge part of this market. I'm supposed to be the funny, happy-go-lucky guy. Mm -hmm. And I haven't made a difference. I haven't made a difference for my people. I haven't. We have the most popular, most popular man on earth. Our, our guy, Rock's our guy. Mm -hmm. But here we are. They still don't really know who we are. That's where I'm at. I, 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 can't, I can't wait for The Rock to do it. I can't wait for Jason Momoa to do it. I, I'm we, us, we gotta do it. How many, how, many, how many high, rich, powerful Polynesians have come before us and they have dropped the ball? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing on them. I'm just saying, whatever it is, I'm walking the walk and I wanna talk the talk. So I'm gonna pull all my resources. I'm gonna do whatever I can to battle mental health at the root of its problem which is the way we think as Polynesian people that, uh, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's wrong. Awesome. Thank you. Well, guys, yeah, Buddha, thank you so much for your time. You can stay as long as you need to before you go on there. Do you have any closing thoughts before we, we transition to Stanley's story? I'm not an expert in the field, guys. I just, I'm really, like I said, it's, it's all really raw and new to me. I'm still... Uh, trying to process uh, a lot of the traumatic stuff that my dad did to me and my uncles, you know, and the uh, abuse. But if, if I'm really going to be about this healing journey, then it's time to, to put up and, and, not, and, and not shut up, you know, put up or shut up. Awesome. Well, thank you, Buddha. Uh, if you guys can fi find him on Facebook, on LinkedIn, um, and obviously, Leroy, it means a lot that you would come out and share your story with us and continue to heal. We appreciate it very much. So we're going to transition just really, really quickly. And obviously, Buddha is a brother from another mother, but I actually have a brother from the same mother um, that I'd love to have him just kind of share his story really quickly uh, in Stanley Havili. So Stanley, let me try to find, I want to pin your video here really quickly. So just to give you guys a heads up as I do that. So Stanley... Uh, was the first high school player from the state of Utah to go directly to USC. Uh, and since then, there have actually been eight others. Uh, had a phenomenal career. Left there as the, as the all-time receptions leader um, at USC as a fullback with, you know, 100 and I can't remember, 50-something. Uh, went to three or four Rose Bowls and then had a really good career. Ended up getting drafted by the Eagles. 
um, and then traded to the Colts and then finished up at the Seahawks. But what's interesting was, is we didn't realize that he was, he was fighting some demons himself. Um, and so he was actually fighting an addiction uh, to painkillers. And so I guess in one game, Stanley, I remember uh, there was an opiate, or excuse me, you ended up taking a pills against the 49er game. It was one of the best games you'd ever had. And so he ended up having an affinity to that. Um, so let me just share one story before I transition to Stanley. So we didn't know that he was basically addicted to, to painkillers until a year later. Um, July 24th, our family, we were getting ready to watch uh, the Pioneer Day Parade here in Utah. And then Stanley told us he was getting a divorce. And we were just like, we had no idea. Two days later, three days later, me and my siblings ended up receiving a text saying, I love you. And it was really, it was really weird because it was at the time, 2015, I've never seen Stanley text an emoji. So it was, I heart you. And all my brothers and sisters were like, love you, love you, love you. And I try to blow up this dude's phone. And it kept going to the answer machine. And so then I called his wife to find out where he was. She said, he's in Park City. Just so you know, he's been acting weird this last year. And uh, he's, he's been addicted to painkillers. And so I knew that he was using a, a Marriott discount from one of my friends. And so we called the three Marriott's, found out where he was, was able to knock down the door an hour after he had taken 120 pills. And we caught him just in time. And, and now Stanley has been sober since January, or excuse me, July 27th of 2015. And so Stanley, would love for you to share your story with the people here today. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, man, thank you, Buddha, for that um, dilemma when we'd sit in groups in, at treatment and said, man, take a hit of that, right? Like that vulnerability, the spirit that brings is powerful. Um, and so thank you, Buddha, for that. Um, when, I, when I usually talk about my story, I use the analogy of jumping off of a, a diving board when you get to the bottom of the pool, you run out of breath. And when you're at the bottom of the pool, uh, you're not thinking about um, what everyone's doing. You're not thinking about what you're gonna eat later that day. All you're thinking about is, man, I need to breathe. Now, that feeling you have at the bottom of a pool is the same feeling that an addict has when he wants to use. We're not thinking about, you know, Am I fulfilling my role as a father? Am I doing my role as a, as a husband or a friend? All I'm thinking about is, man, I need to use. Uh, and then after that, or I need to breathe. And then after that, I can help. Now, Shani kind of shared, uh, you know, the bottom of my story. I just want to share the beginning of it. I grew up down in Glendale. I'm the, the sixth kid um, of eight. Shani is the oldest. And... Um, Man, at a young age, I just loved watching my brothers play ball. And as soon as I got the opportunity to play football, I, I, I knew this was my thing. Um, in, in recovery, I share with, with um, people that I meet with, is in life, you carry two coins. Um, on one coin, you, you carry on, on one side, there's pride. And on the other, there's shame. And then on the other coin, there's gratitude. And on the other side, there's humility. Um, throughout my life, I've only carried one coin and that coin was pride and shame. So when I failed, there was shame. When I succeeded, there was pride. So by the time I got to, to high school, my senior year, I, I had roughly around 40 to 50 scholarship offers to play pretty much anywhere I wanted to, um, uh, in the nation. I chose USC because I wanted to go out there and compete. At USC, Shawnee shared, I had a, a, an amazing career for, for a fullback. I was blessed to be drafted into the NFL by the Eagles while I was there. Um, and he got fired his, uh, my second year in the league. And, and when our new coach came in, he traded me to the Colts. Now, in football, I played fullback, probably one of the worst positions, in my opinion, in football. All we do is just run full speed and hit the guy on the other side of the line. We get no glory. Um, and, and when I got to Indiana, we had a quarterback named Andrew Luck, uh, who we brought in his offensive coordinator from Indianapolis. I mean, from uh, Stanford. And 
I, I still remember the first meeting we had with, uh, what I had with the team in OTAs. We go through the install and um, Pep Hamilton, who's our OC, looked at me and he said, Stanley, by the end of this year, you're gonna be two inches shorter. And basically what he meant was, I'm gonna hit every play I'm in. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a pass catching fullback. I'm not a, like an ISO fullback. And so I had said in my mind, okay, you know what, to keep my job, to provide for my family, I'm gonna go out there and just, you know, go as hard as I can go. Um, by week four of that year, I remember how much pain I was in. My shoulders were hurting. I was getting stingers every other hit. If you guys don't know what that, that is, when you hit someone, your neck goes back, it hits a punch nerve. And I was, uh, my right arm would go numb for a couple plays. And uh, week four, we had one of the biggest games of the year. We were playing the San Francisco 49ers. And um, on that defense, they had Patrick Willis and Navarro Bowman, two of the best linebackers in the NFL. The year before, they had just gone to the Super Bowl. And I remember how the feeling, I, I felt so overwhelmed. Like, man, I, I better get through this game. They're counting on me. We're going to. Because Jim Harbaugh was the coach, the Stanford coach and Andrew Luck's coach, we're going to give him a taste of his own medicine and we're going to run the ball down their throat. And before the game, I'm sitting in the locker room and I, I, I remember one of my teammates coming up to me. He's like, bro, just take one of these for the game. And like Shona shared, I took a couple pain pills and I went out there and I played one of the best games I've ever played. And we dominated uh, the 49ers. And I remember thinking after the game, man, I'm like, dude, I can't believe I haven't played with this, these pills my whole career. What was I thinking? Um, so then I, in my mind, I was like, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to use pain pills for games. And so every, every Sunday, right before the game, I take pills. Um, and then within a couple of weeks, it was uh, in the NFL, you, you wear pads only on Wednesdays. And so I said, okay, I'm only going to take pain pills on Wednesdays when we wear pads. And then by the end of that season, I was taking pain pills from the minute I was awake to the minute I, I went to bed. Um, uh, our second to last game that year, we were playing uh, in the playoffs, divisional round. We were playing the Kansas City Chiefs and we were losing by a lot. I think it was, I think it's one of the greatest comebacks in playoff history that round. Um, and I remember thinking at halftime, man, I cannot wait to lose this game because I want to go home and use drugs. Uh, we ended up coming back and winning that game. The next game we played um, uh, the New England, New England Patriots. And in that game, it was like any other play. Andrew Luck calls a play. I motion to the backfield. We were on a draw play. And I, I blocked the linebacker. And then uh, it was like a five-yard game, and Andrew called, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. So we ran the same play, come back. I hit the same linebacker. I shatter my shoulder blade and um, shatter my shoulder cap in, in four pieces. And I go, back, I go back to the sideline, and I remember the only thing I was thinking, it wasn't, man, I'm done playing football. Man, I'm injured. It was the doctors are going to give me pain pills. Um, Fast forward to the next year, I couldn't pass a drug test. Uh, I was still on, on, on the Colts team. Uh, and I went throughout that year, I couldn't, I couldn't pass a drug test. My shoulder, I didn't feel comfortable playing football. They ended up cutting me week 10. I got picked up by the uh, Seattle Seahawks, my college coach, um, I think week 12. And I went out there and my cousin, Tony Moyaki was there, Will Dupuafu, it couldn't have been a better situation for me. Um, but I was miserable inside. Uh, here, here I am living my dream, playing in the NFL. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't stop using drugs. Couldn't stop using pills. And within three weeks, four weeks, I, I walked into Pete Carroll's office. And I said, man, I, I want to go home. Um, I don't feel comfortable playing right now with my shoulder. Send me home. But inside, I, I was like, man, I, I just want to go home and use and so I drove home. Um, within, I want to say, three weeks from leaving there, uh, I was kicked out of my house with my wife living in a hotel. 
um, no, no one in my family knew that I was struggling. All, uh, all my brothers and sister, every, everyone that knew me um, thought that I was just, you know, I would invite my sisters and my brothers to come over and swim at the hotel pool. Uh, but I acted like we were just renting it for the, I mean, using it for the pool when, when actually I was living there for seven months. Now, for, se for those seven months, I went from playing at, at, for the Seahawks at around 250 pounds um, to July, I, I had lost roughly about 60 pounds. So I was 190 pounds. Um, only time I would leave the hotel was to buy drugs or to get food or to pick up my kids. Um, you know, and, and, and the hardest part for me Getting sober was uh, realizing, dealing with all that shame of, of the danger I put my kids through. I, I, um, I remember sharing this story with Dilemma and I had an epiphany. Addicts uh, or people that struggle, man, we, addicts especially, we're not bad people that need to get good. We're, we're, we're sick people that need to get well. And I was so blinded. I, I remember I was, I was picking up drugs one time um, and my kids were in the back, my two kids. Uh, I think my daughter was three and my son was one. And my dealer gets in the car and I'm sitting there and he's dropping the F-bomb and he's swearing and I just want the drugs, right? And I remember stopping him and saying, hey, dude, don't swear, my kids are in the back. And when I got sober, I didn't realize how much danger that I was putting them in. And um, in my mind, I thought I was being a good person by telling my dealer not to swear and how backwards that is, right? Um, now to July 27th, I, uh, I woke up July 27th. And I remember trying to FaceTime my wife. My wife had already served me papers. I shared with my family uh, that I was getting a divorce. Um, I remember for those seven months, how much shame, so much shame I was dealing with. Um, you know, a year prior, I was playing in the NFL and I brought so much pride to my family. And within that year, I was 190 pounds, drug addicts living in a hotel. And I could not live with that. Um, obviously, to get to that point in playing football, uh, I, I, you know, I, I put the work in and I did it. Now, with addiction, it's nothing about willpower. Uh, mental health, it's nothing about willpower, right? And I thought, you know, for the two years I was using, I'm going to just will myself out of this. And the harder I tried, the worse it got. And so on, on January, uh, July 27th, I FaceTimed my wife and um, I had been thinking about suicide for a long time. I didn't think I'd actually go through with it. And I remember FaceTiming her and she wouldn't answer my call because the kids were still sleeping. And I just was like, dude, what's the use? I can't stop using drugs. I'm not even with my kids. Um, what am I doing? And so I poured out all the drugs onto the bed. And I remember kneeling there. And um, I tried to do it all at once, but I couldn't. So I had it separated into two piles. And I took the first pile. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to pass out. So I better hurry up and take this. And I shoved it in my mouth. And I remember waking up um, and seeing my brother's at my bedside. I don't remember much, but I remember the feeling of love that I had from them. And all of a sudden that shame, I no longer felt. And I felt a relief because um, finally people knew, finally those closest to me knew that I had a problem. Um, after that, I was sent to, after you do something like that, I thought I was getting, getting discharged. My wife was still leaving me. So I was, I was still determined to, um, you know, if she, if she didn't stay with me to end my life. Um, but after you do something like that, they send you to a psych ward. 
And at this psych ward, you're 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 there for you know seven to ten days until they think you're stable enough to leave. And at this place, um, without any drugs in my system, I was able to come to a lot of realizations. Uh, there was this poem that was there. Now, up to this point, for the most part, I didn't have a relationship with God. Um, there wasn't a. Uh, I didn't really seek out help from a higher power. And there was this poem there that I share every time I talk that I read in, in the psych ward that they have posted right next to the TV. Um, and I wanna read that for you guys. And for, you know, for those of you that are thinking like, you know, why is Buddha and Stanley sharing this? Why are they um, you know, being vulnerable and being open about this? This, this poem is why. It's called Holes. I have, I had been in that hole for a very long time, in the dark, in the damp, in the cold and the slime. The shaft was above me. I could see it quite clear, but there was no way I could ever reach it from here. Nor could I remember the world way up there, so I lost all my hope and gave in to despair. I knew nothing but darkness, the floors and the walls. Then off in the distance, I heard someone call. Get up, get ready. There's nothing the matter. Take rocks and old sticks and build up a fine ladder. This had never occurred to me, had not crossed my mind, but I started to stack all the stones I could find. When I, when I ran out of stones, then old sticks were my goal. From, for one way or another, I'd get out of that hole. So I soon had a ladder that was sturdy and tall, and I thought, I'll soon leave this place once and for all. I climbed up my ladder and it was no easy chore. I climbed up the ladder, but soon had to stop for my ladder stopped short some 10 feet from the top. I climbed back down my ladder and started to cry. I'd done all I could do. I gave my best try. And in spite of my work in this hole, I must die. And all I could uh, do was sit and think why. Was my ladder too short or my hole much too deep? Then from away upon high came a voice, do not weep. And then faith, hope, and love entered into my chest. And this voice said to me that I'd done my best. He said, you've worked very hard and your labor's been rough, but the ladder you've built is at last tall enough. Do not despair. You have reason to hope. Just climb up your ladder. I'll throw down my rope. I climbed up the ladder then climbed up the cord. When I got to the top, there stood the Lord. I could not be happier. My struggle was done. I blinked in the brightness that came from the sun. I fell to the ground. His feet did I kiss. I cried. What can I do to repay thee for this? Then he looked all about him. There were holes in the ground. They had people inside and were seen all around. There were thousands of holes that were damp, dark, and deep. The Lord turned to me and he said, feed my sheep. He then went on his way to help other lost souls. And I got right back to work calling down to the holes. Get up, get ready. There's nothing the matter. Take rocks and old sticks and build up a fine ladder. I not, it now was my turn to spread the good word, the most glorious message that man ever heard. There's one who is willing and one to save on. We've got to be ready when he gives us a call. He'll pull us all out of the hole that we're in and save a, all our souls from death and from sin. So do not lose faith. There is reason to hope. Just build up your ladder and he'll throw down your rope. Um, thank you. I shared, I shared this, I remember reading this poem. I said, man, if there's ever a point I get out of this hole, I promise you I'll share my story. If you save my family, I will share it. Because if I don't share it, my parents will. If I don't share it, my, wives, my wife will. So talking about this being vulnerable is not only freeing for me, but also gives me the opportunity to look back on how bad mm -hmm. things were and how far I've gotten through the help of, of my higher power. Um, so yeah, that's my story. And thank you so much for sharing, Stanley. We have five minutes left for questions. Uh, there, there were two things that I've learned personally from Stanley's experience. I remember when he was released from uh, rehab in the psych ward, we had a family meeting with our family and my dad was like, okay, whatever you guys do, don't, don't talk about Stanley's problems. Don't share it. And I remember Stanley boldly saying, dad, no, 
like don't broadcast it, but if anyone asks, share it, right? Because it's going to help somebody and it helps me stay accountable. The other thing that I learned in, in with Dave Kozlowski, he had actually spoke at a conference with Stanley and he had said something that really that really just tore, tore to my core. And that was <laughs> anyone that's, that's, that's thinking about suicide, they don't want to die. They just don't want to live the way that they're living, right? And that's something that we need to recognize. You don't understand mental health until it actually penetrates your inner circle. So we have five minutes left. Any open questions for Stanley um, about his experience, his life, mental health? The floor is yours. I just had a quick comment. Just wanted to thank Stanley for sharing. So damn proud of you, Stanley. I love you. We've grown up together and um, appreciate you sharing your story. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, I got to say that there is a great message in uh, God's love for those who attempt suicide. Um, there is no hatred. There is no failure. But Stanley, I'm grateful your brothers were there for you. And I'm grateful you're there for others now. Hey, Stanley. So um, my question is just like hearing your experience, it sounds like it, that was like a really weak point in your life. But seeing you now and the way you've you know, just been pro proactive with it. Would you say now it's like a strength, like that experience strengthened you through going through that? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I, um, you know, it's given me the ability to do something I've never done before football. And that's to really actually connect with people. You know, that's one thing that was so foreign to me. Um, Bef uh, before all this was, man, I, I lacked the ability to be vulnerable. I lacked the ability to, um, to, to accept, uh, to, to openly talk about my weaknesses, you know, and by doing so, I've been able to really form, you know, relationships with people that I, I love. And, you know, I, I would sit in meetings with um, other addicts and alcoholics and I'd be there like, man, you guys know me better than, than my family, you know, because of, of that. So yeah, you know what, without this, I, I, I don't know where I would be. And I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the, the struggles that I have. With it. We're, we're at time. Is there any other questions uh, that you guys might have? If not, I'll turn it over to Stanley for final thoughts. Um, one funny experience. I remember when we were going to Stanley's graduation, um, when he was graduating from rehab and we actually had all of our nieces and nephews, about 36 of them. And they were going around. And if you guys have been to rehab, you know, my name is Stanley. I'm an addict. My name is Todd. I'm an addict. And I remember all the nieces and nephews when we went to go to lunch after they said, dang, uncle Stanley's like wreck it Ralph. And that just made me laugh. Mm -hmm. Anyways, does anybody, anybody have any questions? Uh, one more question before we turn over to Stanley for a closing thought. Awesome. Stanley, I just had a quick question. Um, first off, thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, I, I just found it interesting that uh, your family, as in your extended family, did recognize the struggles right away. Um, so what are some, some red flags that you would alert us to if we recognize, if we see them in people that we love? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things is just them distancing themselves, you know what I mean? And then if you're using drugs or alcohol, um, or you're struggling with mental health, oftentimes, uh, you can tell by their physical appearance. Um, and I mean, when I pulled up to, you know, July 24th, the parade, I remember my sister saying like, oh my gosh, you've lost a lot of weight. You're skinny. I'm like, yeah, I've been on a diet, you know, so they're never going to say anything, but you can tell for the most part by their physical appearance, if not, you know, how they've been acting. Awesome. Any closing thoughts, Stanley, before we go? We got one minute left. One thing uh, I just have my last thing is, is um, for, for those that are early in recovery, this helped me uh, or, you know, any, anyone that is, I may not know what God's will is for me, uh, but I know what it isn't. 
So for me, it's, it's not using drugs and it's not killing myself. I'll do everything else, right? So when it gets hard for me, I'll just, I know what it is. So thanks, bro. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining. First Monday of every month, uh, first Friday of every month at noon Mountain Time, you click on this link and we'll have good content. Everyone have a happy Friday and take care. Thanks, Stanley. Thanks, Buddha. Thanks, y'all. All right, y'all. Take care.